cantar esta canción con mucho cariño de mi corazón a la República Dominicana, la casa del merengue y la casa de la bacha. On a lonely planet, slowly spinning its way to damnation, amid the incompetence and unpreparedness of lesser space programs, one team stands resilient against the herds, putting their lives on the line to aid those who were previously unaware of the quick save option. Yes, it's the incredible adventures of Jebediah and his crack team of Kerbinauts. They are the Blunderbirds. Saving the Kerbin race, one stranded explorer at a time. What is going on everyone and welcome to another episode of the Blunderbirds uh, in which for the first time ever we're going to be rescuing someone from the Discord rather than on Reddit or um, I feel like I've done another one. Oh yeah I rescued Mark Thrym as just part of a YouTube thing so this is kind of like you know a new a new direction. Um, I'm thinking about I thought about doing things on the forums or on Twitter as well but for now this is kind of a, a, a little I don't know I just saw this on my Discord server and I was like hey I don't know what to do for a video this week. <laughs> Let's do another episode of Blunderbirds. It, I, I, this was not rushed, but I've had a lot on my plate recently because I, I said this in my Planet Coaster video, but I know a lot of you don't watch my Planet Coaster videos. Not that I'm complaining, by the way, I'm just, I'm just stating the fact. Um, I'm actually working quite hard on uh, Green Harvest, which is like my next Kerbal film, the sequel to Junior Attacks and Expedition Eve. So a lot of my time in Kerbal Space Room right now is getting footage for that. So the rest of the time I'm just like, well, I need, I need to make something <laughs> for this sadly because Green Harvest is no, nowhere near far enough along completion for me to start releasing the episode. So that's kind of why this was kind of, I didn't have much time to plan a Kerbal video this week. And I know last week's was a bit of a cop out video as well. It was just like a stream highlights thing. Although you guys did, um, you know, it was quite well received. So thank you. I'm glad, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I mean, if you hated it. Sorry, um, I'll try harder next time. Uh, but yes, so this is nothing really too special about this ascent really. We've got quite a basic rocket really. We're going for an Apollo style mission. We're going to be rescuing three Kerbals from the surface of Duna. So the lander, the surface lander we'll be using will have a crew capacity for four because I like to send uh, another Kerbal down just to sort of, I don't know, liaise <laughs> with the stranded, um, the stranded Kerbals on the surface. The only exceptions were uh, the Mohol rescue because logistically it's quite hard to get a small enough craft if there's another Kerbal on the descent vehicle as well and the Eve rescue I did just because uh, it's quite hard to make heavy Eve landers with more than one crew module although I did do another Eve Blunderbirds that had a capacity for five so I could send Jebediah down or any other Kerbal really but um, unfortunately the guy's mods meant that I couldn't get it to load properly so in the end I just did an Eve sea level return with that ship and was like hey Yo, use this, download the craft file and <laughs> you can do this as your rescue mission. Now, um, speaking of mods breaking the game actually, you may have noticed that in the little intro sequence when I was showing off the guy's st stranded craft, he has some sort of modded parts. Now, nothing on this ship here uses mods, it's all stock game. Um, I had to install the parts mods to load his craft. And unfortunately with my version of KSP, coupled with the other mods I used, they weren't, my, the mods weren't all compatible. As a consequence of this, uh, the electric charge, not the electric charge, but electric generating parts, uh, aside from alternators and engines, I'm talking about solar panels and RTG. Speaking of solar panels, there they are. <laughs> um, solar panels and RTGs don't regenerate the electric supplies. And I was like, ah, you know, I tried for quite a while to get the, uh, to get the mods to all work together, but unfortunately I couldn't. So full transparency, I did have to do this mission with infinite electricity turned on. Luckily everything else is set to default, like crash damage, max temperature, all that is, is left off, obviously. But for just to make the mods work, I had to turn on infinite electricity. Ouch. I'll, I'll revisit this in just a second. Um, here you can see me showing how to get a Juno encounter. So I, li I like how I'm now talking about this after the footage is gone. But you can rewind after I finish talking. You basically, if you imagine drawing a line from Kerbin to the Sun to Juna the angle that that forms would have to be 44.4 degrees. You could use a mod like Kerbal Alarm Clock or an actual interplanetary transfer window 
tool that you can get online. Uh, I just eyeballed it. <laughs> and you can see we made a maneuver there and it was quite easy to get. Just drag out prograde um, along Kerbin's kind of trajectory around the sun and it's fairly easy to get a trajectory, uh, get an encounter with Juna. Juna's on a very similar plane to Kerbin, so it's it's not like Eve where you have to do a little bit of tweaking around with uh, the normal and anti-normal modes. Anyway, yes, back to the electric charge drama. Uh, I, I, I don't feel too bad about it because as you can see this craft is loaded with batteries and solar panels so it will certainly work if you didn't have a, a unlimited electricity turned on but just like I say I couldn't unfortunately get the save files to work together unless I did enable uh, input electricity. So that's, that's the only kind of bamboozle that you'll see in this video. And here is the map screen now, getting the Juno encounter. I like to disable the maneuver node at the last minute so you can kind of look at the patched conics because the maneuver node is not always a great predictor because it doesn't really, it's not, they're not very reliable. So when you're trying to get kind of precise encounters, so interplanetary encounters or kind of rendezvous with ships, I like to do the very last bit of the burn without any maneuver node there and just watch it myself. Um, so there you go. And we're going to do a nice little cinematic flyaway from Kerbin. And we're going to do a quick mid-course correction, just so we can get our actual periapsis around Juno to not only kind of pass into its atmosphere so we can perform an air break, but also to make sure that we're flying over the uh, crash lander. So we're not going to be going for an equatorial orbit because, as you can see, our Kerbals are not along the equator. In fact, they're um, very much at the South Pole. So we're going for a po almost completely polar orbit. Slightly, slightly inclined, but, you know, pretty much polar. So we're just going to line ourselves up. So you can see 3.3 meters per second, very, very, very short burn. So um, even the nuclear engine, which has abysmal thrust to weight ratio anyway, I had to crank that right down in terms of its thrust limiters, uh, just so I could get this to be nice and precise. And there we are. I think that's a pretty good. So we can do a little bit of fine tuning. You can just do this by creating maneuver nodes, or you can just do what I do and just sort of randomly point the ship in different directions until you kind of got the uh, and start burning until you've got the uh, orbital line in the right place. We can just fast forward a little bit through that. And as you can see, we're pretty much passing completely over the stranded curls now. So it's it's looking a good. So they are. We're warping around. And there we go, we are entering Juno's atmosphere momentarily. So obviously we're going to have to uh, retract the solar panels, and well that's it really. Juno, Juno, Juno air brakes, unlike EVE air brakes, or Kerbin air brakes, or Joule aero brakes, which are pretty much impossible these days, uh, Juno's atmosphere is very very thin, so it's incredibly hard to actually overheat, especially coming in from this kind of, at this kind of speed. Kerbin's orbit is not too dissimilar to Juno's orbit, so the relative speed that you come in at is not too bad. If we were coming in from somewhere like Joule or EVE, uh, where the orbit is much, much more different, our interplanetary speed and sort of speed of entry at Juno will be much higher. But, um, you know, not a problem. As you can see, you might have seen, like, the little temperature gauges enabled things flashing up, because I was like, have I got temperature gauges enabled? Because I can't see any appearing. I know one did pop up for a second, but, you know, I think we were pretty much fine. And yes, we are playing at 100% re-entry heating, just in case you're wondering if I've just got it turned down or something. So yeah, like, I know if you watched my video last week, you may have seen that I put a message at the beginning saying that I was away, uh, and so I didn't really have time to make a video, and the reason I was away, I, think, I don't really know what to talk about now, so I'll just talk about what, what's been going on, really, in my world. So, um, I was away uh, visiting a little town called Thursk in North Yorkshire, I think it's North Yorkshire, or just north of the country. For me, it's about an eight and a half hour drive, so anyone that watches Off the Hook and recognises Tupper's name, Tupper lives... Uh, near Wales, so what I do is I tend to drive up to his house and I spend the night at his house, and then he drive he takes over the driving all the way to Thursk, so it kind of splits the drive. It makes it a little bit more tolerable. Oh, here we are, by the way, with the Kerbals. Uh, we'll, we're switching to the stranded Kerbals here, so we can time warp and make sure that we're nice and underneath the orbital path of the rescue ship, and then we can, you know, initiate our descent. So yeah, Thursk is a weird town. Uh, we like to go up there kind of once or twice a year because we've got a friend there that owns a house. So we all kind of go up and have a big sort of a, a jolly old time, uh, have a little house party for a few days and, uh, you know, just chill out and relax, I guess. And like I say, Thursk is great because it's, it's got a population of about 4,000 people and it's got 22 pubs. It's amazing. The actual, the actual city centre of Thursk is amazing. It's basically just a, a giant car park and then just surrounded by pubs and a Greg's. I'm not even like doing trying to saying this to be funny. If you go on Google Street View on Thursk, it is literally a car park surrounded by pubs. It's my favourite place in the whole world. So <laughs> that was that was where I was. And with that, uh, we can initiate our Duna descent. 
So June is great because it has an atmosphere. It's not a very thick atmosphere, it's very tenuous, so you have to use quite a lot of parachutes, um, more than you would need for, say, Leith, Eve or Kerbin. Uh, but you can do the bulk of your uh, slowing down and touchdown just using air braking, like I say, if you have enough parachutes. We'll have to do the very last bit of the descent uh, with engine assistance, just so we're not touching down too hard. But I'm, I'm sure this thing would have survived, to be honest. But just to be safe, I did a little bit of puff with the arrow spike. And there's the target now, and our shoots are deploying. This takes a little bit of trial and error, really. I'd recommend liberal use of the quick save, especially if you've not done many kind of precise landing attempts on Juna before. I got quite lucky here, actually. It seemed to work out. Things just seem to fall together quite nicely with me. Um, so you got those drogue shoots there to do the initial bit of slowing down in the upper atmosphere. Again, because the atmosphere is so thin on Juna, if you just have main shoots, usually they don't deploy soon enough to adequately slow yourself down, so it's good to do a little bit of initial slowing down using drogue shoots before you allow the main ones to deploy. And look at that, we, I'd say we got ourselves pretty close. Uh, within two kilometers I like to aim for in Blunderbirds. Uh, I think the exception for that was Eve, because Eve's just very hard to get precise landings on. I think I was a whopping five kilometers away for that play, so I'm very sorry everyone for letting you down on that occasion. And here we are. I've got SAS turned off because uh, we're being stabilized by the parachutes, so there's no real need for it. Slowing down, basically I was aiming to be under three meters per second for touchdown, so... There we go. Now those landing legs, they are very resilient. They can take quite a beating. They can take a fairly rough touchdown, but you know, it's nice just to kind of, I like playing with a little bit of realism in mind. Hence why I did a massive air break <laughs> with my nuclear reactor engine facing. So I guess, you know, artistic liberties are taken in places. So nothing left to do. I don't know why I didn't fast forward into the daytime actually, so you can actually see things a little better. I know YouTube does tend to darken videos. I try and counteract this by having Planet Shine installed and bumping up the light intensity, and I kind of color correct my videos as well. But you know, YouTube it does uh, crapify the, the quality somewhat. So I hope you can see this okay. And now we've got all our Kerbals to be rescued outside of our lander. Jebediah can get on his EVA, fall down like he normally does, and deploy our Blunderbirds flag as as is tradition in this series. And there we go, and cut to a daytime shot now because I remembered, oh yeah, I'm making a video, we should probably do this in the daytime. But look at that magnificent shot of the Blunderbirds flag, and with that we can board our Kerbals onto the, into the lander and, uh, you know, get ready for uh, rendezvousing with the mothership. You know, I actually really liked the way this lander came out. I was experimenting with kind of different... I didn't really know how to do it. I was thinking about using like the Apollo-style command pod, but then that's only three-seater, so I wasn't quite sure how to add another crew seat. But I thought I'd use the Hitchhiker storage pod with like a probe core, and then I added those kind of little... It looks a bit like udders, doesn't it? Those, engine, those fuel tanks near the aero spike, and there's some reaction wheels down there as well, just to keep this thing under control, because Juno's atmosphere is thin, but, and this is, but it is there, and this isn't the most aerodynamic of shapes, this craft, so it does want to wobble a little bit upon ascent, so I do have a, quite a lot of reaction wheels, well, th four of the smallest reaction wheels, which I think equates to one of the medium-sized ones, you know, the green ones. Uh, but there's our target ship, by the way, that's kind of where I position myself to launch, and then we're going to be flying along the 315 degree vector on the nav ball, just because that's the trajectory, roughly, of the rescue ship. So we can throttle up the area spike a little bit, retract the landing legs, and then throttle up and begin our rapid ascent through the atmosphere. Juno's atmosphere is very weird. It's, like I said earlier, it's thin, but it is there. It's quite thick towards the lower part, and then it very, very rapidly thins out and the further you ascend. It's kind of like a very, it's a bit like the old Kerbin atmosphere, where it's very soupy near the, near the, to the base, near the ground, uh, and then it rapidly thins out. And I'm using the Aerospike engine here, just because the Aerospike, I did a video about Aerospikes actually, but um, in case you haven't seen that one, Aerospikes are designed to maintain their efficiency throughout an atmosphere. Most engines are optimized for certain things, like for example, the nuclear engine is optimized to work in a vacuum, as is like the Poodle and the Terrier, whereas things like the Vectors and Mammoths, they're optimized to work in thick atmospheres, hence why Eve landers run the game for things like Vectors, Mammoths, ma Mastodons, that sort of thing. But the Aerospikes, um, they're designed to be kind of maximally efficient at every level of atmosphere, really, if that makes sense, at every atmospheric pressure. That's because it's kind of like an inverted bell so he's got that spike there. The if you imagine like an engine bell, the uh, inner spike forms like the virtual bell, and then the air pressure around it presses the rocket 
like exhaust against the spike and then as the pressure releases it's essentially like having a wider engine bell as you get higher into the atmosphere because the air pressure is lower did that make sense i probably should have scripted that or written something down so i knew what i was talking about because i feel like i just i didn't do a particularly articulate job but uh, i did do a video on aerospikes if you want to just i don't know you just search on youtube matt Lown aerospike maybe i'll remember to put a link in the description or something who knows but uh, yeah, there's a bulk of our ascent done, so it wasn't a very particularly good ascent to be honest, but I realised that I did leave it a bit too late for our launch and our target was going to be ahead of us, so I thought let's just try and get into orbit as fast as we can <laughs> and then just catch up. And we have plenty of delta V in this thing really, too much delta V, so I knew efficiency wasn't really something I'd have to be too worried about. Yeah, there's a circularization burn. I left it so my apoapsis was slightly lower than the target's orbit because the target vessel is going to be ahead of us so we want to be going into a faster orbit in order to catch up with it and faster orbits are lower so you want to get into a lower orbit if the target's in front of you if the target's behind you you want your orbit to be slightly higher so you'll be going slower relative to the target that's what i'm doing really rendezvous it's just a lot of practice people always ask me kind of how do i get better at rendezvous i'm just like it's just practice unfortunately there's no real secret trip really like one weird trick nasa hates it uh, it's just I guess it's kind of knowing how to do it, but you can kind of figure that out from watching videos. Like Scott Manley's tutorial is pretty much unbeatable. People always ask me to make rendezvous tutorials, and I kind of have done in the past, sort of, but for just basic rendezvousing around Kerbal, I'm just like, look, Scott's video, you can't improve upon it. It's perfect. So, um, you know, just uh, search up Scott Manley docking tutorial or building space stations. I can't remember exactly what it's called, but that's that should go to if you want to learn how to do rendezvous. Anyway. With that, there's our target. Now, you may have noticed as well, oh, I can bump up the uh, light intensity there. You may have noticed as well that neither of these ships have monopellant. So what I'm doing is I'm locking this one to face the target. So I've targeted the uh, lander in the mothership and I've targeted the mothership in the lander. So they'll basically always remain pointing to each other, even when we're not actually fo like controlling the mothership. It's on auto SAS. It will continue to track the docking port on this thing. And then we can just coast them together nice and slowly. And they should, you know, they should dock no problem. So I like to keep it kind of 0.5 meters per second or slower for these sorts of things. And just use time warp to get them, fast, uh, get them together faster. And there we go. So just kind of doing like a cinematic-y sort of zoom in. There goes the shield. And then I thought, let's try and do it. So the shield opens a little bit later on i don't know why <laughs> i thought oh, it'd be cool kind of little shot to get it open at the last second there we go well i mean it wasn't really the last second was it but it kind of looks a little more satisfying boom so we are docked and with that we can transfer some of the liquid fuel into the mothership what i decided to do because we have enough delta v just from again from a realism point of view it'd be nice if the kerbals had as much uh breathing room as possible so we're actually going to leave the lander attached for the duration of the well for the remainder of the flight just so we've got a little bit more kind of interior space for our kerbals now we've suddenly gained three more crew members to our uh, roster so there we go now rather than waiting for a kerbin encounter to occur what we can do is we can just get ourselves on a trajectory that makes our orbital line pa kind of pass over kerbin's orbital line if that makes sense and then once we've passed the ascending node we can create another maneuver node and essentially force an encounter if that makes sense you'll kind of see it as we go along but that's what i'm doing here so all we need to do first of all is get any old escape trajectory from juna we are coming from juna polar orbit so we're going to be slightly eccentric but luckily it won't have too much of an impact on our overall orbit around the sun so there goes our orbital line now and we'll get ready to cut that throttle in just a second but yeah there we go now now we've kind of got this orbital path you can see that we're not going to get a Kerbin encounter so now what we're going to do is create a maneuver node straight after our descending node or pretty much on the descending node that's the point at which we're going to be crossing Kerbin's orbital line and then you can just drag out either prograde or retrograde uh, in this case I believe I dragged out the prograde vector when we get around to it once this beautiful cinematic shot of us flying away from Juno is over uh, just time warp down you can see there we're going down by dragging out prograde we've got a nice Kerbin encounter for comparatively little expense usually these aren't the particularly costly burns to essentially force yourself an encounter uh, and then we can just execute it now so thrust to weight ratio of the nuclear engine is not great but um, I've been using oh that's something I, I didn't talk about that I planned on talking about some of you may have noticed throughout this video uh, we've been doing physics time warp but I've been warping faster than times four which is the limit of physical time warp that's because I'm using the mod better time warp and it allows you to have physics time warp of uh, my physics time warp settings currently are 
uh, either five times, ten times, twenty times, or fifty times. Fifty times can be a little bit glitchy, so you've got to be careful when using that one if you use that setting yourself. But for sort of engine burns with a nuclear engine, uh, times 10 is a pretty safe amount, to be honest. It's an absolute godsend for EVE missions and MOHO missions. Uh, EVE missions, because there can be a lot of time when you're just in the atmosphere, descending at a very slow rate. And MOHO missions, because there's going to be a lot of very, very long nuclear engine burns, which are not the most uh, enthralling things to execute. Sometimes it can be like half an hour, uh, nuclear engine burns. And with ion engines as well. Uh, I don't know if anyone saw my uh, fully recovered Joule 5 SSTO. I sent like an SSTO to Joule, landed on every single moon, and then came back recovering every single part. Nothing was dumped in orbit. I was very proud of that video, but didn't do that well uh, in terms of views. But, you know, I kind of, I liked to do it. For, I liked it for the achievement it represented. But yes, a lot of ion engines had to be used in that video for it to be possible. And yeah, I don't think I could have done that without better better time warp. So better time warp has my full endorsement. Other mods, I know people will probably ask. Uh, Hyper edits here, although I'm not using it. Um, camera tools, I've not used that either. Vessel mover, I've not used that. Planet shine, I've used. <laughs> uh, scatterer and stock visual enhancements, which I'm using. The, I'm using environmental visual enhancements, but with the stock visual enhancements config files. People always ask me how you install the config files, and I'm just like it says on the wiki page exactly how you do it. The page where you download it from, it has very clear and concise instructions. It's like the Scott Manley rendezvous tutorial. I can't, I, d I can't help you any further than that. Uh, that's, it explains it far better than I could. So now what we're doing is we're just separating this out so we can get our descent module ready to brace for well, re-entry. So I'm just getting the, uh, the landing module clear of the rest of the ship. That's why I left those kind of golden peripheral tanks. I left some liquid fuel in there just so we had enough to kick ourselves away from the mothership. And then we can detach the lower stage, make sure that's nice and clear of us as well. And then we can brace for a uh, Kerbin re-entry. So what we're going to do is face retrograde. Uh, no, just, che just checking the re-entry heating settings there because this guy actually plays on 50% re-entry heating. So I just got really paranoid and kept checking to make sure I had, in fact, increased it to 100%. And, uh, yeah, those temperature gauges started showing up. And then for those landing legs, I don't know why I added them. They're completely, they're cosmetic only, especially because we're going to be landing in the ocean. But I thought it looked kind of cool. Made it look a little bit dragon-esque. Um, but I, I miss, I undershot the land slightly. And I couldn't really be bothered to re-attempt, <laughs> uh, re-attempt the, uh, descent. So there we go. Quite a lot of parachutes because we have that big, kind of heavy hitchhiker storage module underneath the command pod. So I, I went for the safe option, having lots and lots of parachutes. But there they are, all deployed. Not much more to really say, to be honest. That's pretty much this mission wrapped up. So if you enjoyed this video, be, su be sure to subscribe, leave a like. Feels a bit naff saying that. Oh, a little rough touch down on it. Always feel a bit cheesy saying that, but it does, it has been shown help channels, so I feel like I should say that. In addition to this, Discord, which is where this mission originated from, is in the description as well. You can hang out, it's great. Uh, Twitter as well, and Patreon. I think that's all my uh, YouTube admin I needed to cover at the end of the video. There's the Kerbals all recovered. If the screen will load. There we go. So yes, and then with that on screen is a link to the full Blunderbirds playlist. I'll put a link to the Aerospike video I did as well, and the Jewel 5 SSTO videos, because I kind of mentioned that. And that's it. Uh, thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend if you're watching this when it came out. If not, um, buy, buy my merch.